All right, everybody. I'm Michael Johnson with Page One Power. Welcome to the Summit webinar series today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and give everybody a minute or so to start funneling into the room here. Um, as you can see, we've got a panel of some fantastic uh, SEO experts that are ready to share their knowledge with you today. Um, as you're joining, go ahead and throw where you're joining us from into the chat. I uh, would love to hear where you're from and kind of see the uh, vast array of places our audience is joining us from. So go ahead and throw that in there. Um, myself, I am based in Boise, Idaho, which is where Page One Power is headquartered out of. Um, give you all a summary of the weather over here. It was very snowy for the last few weeks. We're now, uh, hey, we got a big high from Vivi there. Hey, Vivi, the link builder, welcome. Uh, it's looking a lot better out there now. We're uh, now out of freezing temperatures, which is really enjoyable. So um, let's go ahead. So just a little quick summary of myself. I'm Michael Johnson. I'm the Partnerships Development Manager here at Page One Power. Um, I've helped hundreds of brands develop link building strategies to help them to drive results with their SEO efforts. And uh, part of my passion is sharing that with folks just like you and kind of sharing the knowledge that, that I hear from people every day. And that's uh, so what we try to do with this webinar series. So uh, with the Summit webinar series, we are doing a industry-specific approach for each uh, chapter of that. And this week is the travel uh, section of that. So we brought in four experts who have either worked at agencies that deal with travel or uh, worked with travel brands themselves. So I'll go ahead and let the uh, panelists introduce themselves, starting with Brian. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been working in digital marketing for the last 14 years in both the client and agency side. And right now I'm working for WMX. It's a boutique agency here in Miami and South Florida, and we specialize in travel and tourism. Fantastic. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, I uh, appreciate it, Michael. Uh, my name is Eric Vias. I am based in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am the director of SEO for MGM Resorts. I've uh, been in SEO, well, digital marketing, but SEO specifically for about 10 years now, uh, but again, both agency um, in-house side, um, been in-house for the past three years with MGM Resorts. So, um, and, and as far as experts, I mean, I appreciate it, but uh, exactly the expert, but you, we, keep, we keep trying. <laughs> Everybody in SEO is just learning every day. Exactly. We're all learning. So uh, I was very true in SEO. I don't know if you can necessarily be an expert. We're all... Uh, we, we, we strive for that expertise, but we're not going to get there. That, that keeps us growing. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Kyle Bullock. I am the global head of SEO for a large uh, travel company known as Flight Center Travel Group, which is based out of Australia. It is a publicly shared company, and uh, we do have uh, several regional websites uh, and a, a lot of brick and mortar locations across uh, hundreds, actually, across several different countries, including Canada and the UK. Uh, we also have uh, uh, additional uh, flight, or I'm sorry, additional travel companies under our portfolio here in the U.S., such as Living Travel, Go Go Vacations, uh, and even Student Universe. Uh, and uh, I've been in the SEO game for about 12 years now, uh, 10 of which in the travel space, and the majority of those have been either in the senior or the director level. Uh, very, very much looking forward to speaking SEO and travel, uh, two very big passions of mine. Go ahead, Renee. Okay. My name is Rene Hernandez. I'm uh, based off of in Edinburgh, Texas, about 10 miles from the Mexican border. Uh, so wonderful weather here right now. Um, I have about eight years in digital marketing overall and specifically specializing SEO and SEM strategies, uh, both in-house and agency settings. And it's been a wonderful ride uh, helping raise visibility for uh, organizations and, and demand generation abroad. Uh, so uh, as recently, one of my uh, recent roles was leading the SEO projects for Six Flags Entertainment. Uh, so really got to dive in, uh, especially at, you know, one of the most sort of uh, impactful times uh, for travel, uh, the, the travel industry, which was, you know, uh, uh, during the COVID era. So thank you for having me today and uh, look forward to, to chatting with everyone here. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves there and getting our audience uh, acquainted. So real quick, before we jump into some seed questions that we had here to get the conversation started, um, I do want to just encourage you all to ask your questions that you have, uh, whether it's related specifically to travel SEO, SEO in general. Um, we got some great folks here that are ready to answer those. So if you want to throw those into the chat, um, go ahead and, and submit those. And then as we progress throughout the webinar, we'll begin to uh, add your questions into the mix so that uh, you can get some actionable feedback that you can use in your day-to-day uh, -day SEO efforts. 
But let's go ahead and kick off with the first question. We'll go ahead and uh, let Brian answer this one first. So let's just kind of keep it general here. We're, a lot of you do come from a travel background. What are some of the unique challenges that you run into every day uh, when it comes to uh, that they maybe apply more specifically to travel and hospitality brands within the SEO space? Yeah, that's a good question. From what I can tell and from what I've experienced, there's really sort of three main things. One is that searchers, when they're looking for travel, often check multiple sources. So you have to hit them on different touch points. And it's definitely competitive, of course, which is the second thing that there is a lot of competition and people rarely convert on the first visit. So you have to kind of focus on repeat visits. And the way you can be successful is having relevant content because the relevant content is what Google will serve. And then finally, we sort of touched on it pre-webinar, but there is the hotel and flight search that Google has in the results. So that can really hinder conversions and, and rankings and progress because people tend to use that rather than necessarily go directly to an OTA or go directly to the booking website. Absolutely. Great answers. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Eric? Any thoughts on that one? Unique challenge? Yeah, um, <clears throat> Brian actually touched on it perfect. Uh, the big one is, is uh, people not converting, you know, being especially in the Vegas um, uh, sphere or what, uh, ecosystem um, and being MGM, MGM Resorts being one of the biggest ones that people aren't exactly converting on the first one. They're, they're very like, I'm going to go, I'm going to spend money. This hotel might be two, $300 a night for the weekend, <clears throat> which one is the right one? So having, having relevant content um, and being able to provide them with more informational content so they can create that, that itinerary, they can start, you know, the wheels start spinning for an idea for a vacation. Um, whereas other people who might be in paid social media or just random stakeholders C-level, they wanna get real transactional, uh, but don't understand that that informational is gonna feed that. So getting buy-in for more informational content is, is a big, big one for me. Um, and then, yeah, seeing, seeing a lot of our, our transactions um, and conversions go down once Google released Google Hotels. Uh, love Google, hate Google Hotels and Google Flights, but um, it's, it's part of the game. So it's definitely my biggest part. For sure. I think it's been interesting that the two things both you've touched on is the importance of content, understanding that you know, with Google always changing, like you said, Google Hotels, Google Flight, all that, the importance of content just goes up that much more in terms of being able to provide value and help information to users. Um, it's not just about being the place that they go to buy, but going to be a, a source of information for people. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It's kind of a common theme already, but Kyle, go ahead. What, what do you think about yeah. that question? Uh, you know, aside from COVID, of course, <laughs> uh, I would have to say technology. Uh, it has always been a challenge from day one, uh, whether it be, you know, front-end booking engine, uh, back-end booking engine, CMS changes, even product feeds, changes to our core algorithms uh, for, for search engines, that, that's always uh, difficult. And, and as SEOs, we have to wear multiple hats and wearing that developer hat has become very critical over time. So uh, being able to really optimize uh, to, to, to meet that user intent and to ensure that you're having that user-friendly experience and complying with Google quality guidelines is extremely difficult. But introduction of new technologies over time has been a big challenge. I mean, we have new things coming up such as Metaverse, something I don't even wanna get into yet, but that's, that's on the forefront. But newer things, uh, the, the, the things, uh, the buzzwords this year for us are the Core Web Vitals, the CWV, you, you've seen it everywhere. Uh, and that is uh, definitely and certainly gonna, going to evolve over time. And we're gonna see some of that here this summer. Uh, that's that's extremely uh, difficult. So you have to stay ahead of that. And, uh, you know, making sure that you're uh, kind of to, to parrot uh, a few of uh, what Eric and also Brian alluded to is uh, you, you've got challenges in the OTA space. You're, you're going up against the kayaks and those guys, the Expedias, but now Google's gotten into the OTA game. So that is a huge challenge there. So that is where the local and the national and then the both can combine together. And that's the way you can actually really separate yourself from that and, uh, and create a whole brand new unique message. But uh, for me, technical, that is, uh, that is definitely the, the area you definitely have to pay attention to and if that's your weakness make sure that's a priority uh, on, on on ensuring that that's what you're getting strength in, in building that for sure great great feedback there how about you Renee um, I, would, I would really reiterate what, what Brian was saying uh, about the you know uh, all the touch points that you know are leading to to the sites people are looking for information 
And I think a lot of the times, uh, especially in the marketing aspect or, or the uh, marketing sphere, uh, people tend to just focus on their direct competitors or the perceived market competitors. Uh, and as Kyle also mentioned, I mean, you have to think of those other, the SERP competitors, you know, who's actually delivering the information that you aren't? Is it TripAdvisor uh, or is it a local, you know, a lot of times uh, if, if you're an organization that has different uh, locations, uh, what is a SERP, uh, a, uh, you know, outlook in those areas? So I think sometimes uh, all the tools in the world can also help us, but it's also good to just really step back and, and dig in a little bit of, of what the, uh, our users or, or the, uh, the end uh, result is, is really like, um, and are we really taking advantage of that? Uh, especially like, for example, um, users sometimes uh, won't care also uh, that you may not be in control of the information or if you haven't updated, if they see that uh, uh, you know, a certain location's uh, op opening hours in a third party website, they're still gonna hold you responsible for it uh, and not so much uh, uh, the, the other side. So it's, it's really on, on you, uh, uh, the SEO or whoever's in charge to take on that extra you know, uh, responsibility to really make sure that if you can correct or overpower that information with your own content, uh, that that's you know, being really taken care of. For sure. Uh, it was really funny. I had a conversation a couple months ago with like a boutique hotel company and it was just, it's impossible for them to rank top rankings for like hotels in this area, like the big head terms, you know, and it, to me just really focused on how important it was for them to get familiar with their local area, understand what people are searching for, what attractions they're looking at visiting in those areas, try to provide as much information as possible that way. Cause that'd probably be the best way for them to be introduced to that audience. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point there, uh, Renee, kind of talking about understanding those sites that aren't exactly your direct competitors in terms of business, but understanding who those could be in search, because that hotel probably doesn't think of these local attractions or informational sites as competitors, yet those are probably the people they should be looking for in their competitor research. So um, great, great examples there. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the next one. And I think Kyle might've mentioned this in his uh, comment, but um, how has COVID affected SEO for the travel and hospitality uh, industries? Is anything that you, you're keeping an eye on or, or putting thoughts into? And we'll let Eric go ahead and start with this one. Uh, so first of all, the what affected, um, before I get into what we've been thinking about, for me, um, it's 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 put me in a different space. Um, obviously, with local SEO, I've been very keen and 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 um, on top of our Google My Businesses. However, uh, MGM Resorts as a whole, and there's only a two person team with SEO there. Uh, we've had to take care of 426 Google My Businesses. That includes closing them, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, reopening, and constantly changing hours, you know, with guidelines. So it's it's becoming more of managing and less of optimizing, unfortunately. Uh, but when people do see that uh, this that's their first line of, of um, communication, that's their first touch point if they're looking for a specific venue, and, uh, you know, MGM casino, uh, it's a specific um, restaurant, where are they going to see it? They're going to see that time. They're going to go there. Okay, it opens at 6, 6 p.m. We're going to be there. Um, so I think that's, it's been, it's been really making me focus on how people see uh, MGM Resorts with our, our Google My Business first so that they don't get upset because if you go somewhere, I mean, I'd be upset too. If I went to a restaurant, said they opened at six and they weren't open until eight. And I'm like, that kind of just ruined my whole plans because I based everything off that Google My Business. Um, I still get mad at that as an SEO. I'll go somewhere and something says it's open at or closes at 11, uh, but it closed at like eight or nine. That makes me mad. I'm like, why do you not update it? So I've been, I think I've been really focused on updating that stuff. Uh, and then with uh, Google's eco-friendly certifications, all the attributes they added for hotels and casinos um, definitely puts a different aspect for those people who are concerned with wellness and eco um, and just having that little badge. If they're looking for a eco-certified hotel, EPA certified, whatever it may be, that's going to pop up and we're going to populate before our, our direct competitors. So that's, that's a big thing that I've been looking into since COVID. Great yeah. piece of feedback. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, as SEOs, uh, we, we rely heavily on data and uh, especially on a large website, uh, looking at, at year over year data, what goes beyond organic sessions, user metrics, we're looking at keyword trends, uh, but making it nearly impossible for projecting accurate SEO forecasts. We have trends, we can look at the data, we can see that if, if somebody's even toying with the, the notion of opening borders or closing borders. I work at international, so I have so many different countries to work with, and uh, that changes. 
You know, things go up, things go down. And then even working in real time with those closures, it's, it's presented so much uh, difficulty to where we have to kind of curb that by uh, relying more on our qualitative data rather than our quantitative data, uh, looking at the art of, and working towards the art of SEO. So that's your authority, your relevance, your trust, building that for your website. That's what you need to do right now. Uh, but making sure that uh, changes uh, in, in, in travel, whether that's adapting new technologies, uh, travel is supposed to be stress-free free, and it's supposed to be fun. And what I'm finding out, what we're seeing on a global level is it's, we have changes. And, and this could be a massive change to the travel industry for good. So what we need to do is be that advocate for our clients, our partners, whatever it may be. And this presents new challenges on a local level where we have new relationship building when certain things happen in real time. We need to adopt new technologies, have robust, intuitive apps to say, we're here for you when things change, because we don't want that stress going on with you. We want to curb that in real time. And uh, that's really going to go really far uh, into the future of, of travel as a whole, but uh, that, that's huge. And also the curation of how travel brands can talk about COVID. I mean, Google and search engines are really, and especially in different countries, are, are controlling that narrative. And so we have to, uh, we have to think creatively on, on ways that we can talk about mandates, talk about testing, talk about that sort of thing. And that brings it all back to the local level of how we externally link to those government sites knowing where to go to and, and adopting that cross channel. This is a whole brand new thing that uh, cross channel has been important, but now we need to really look at how we're doing uh, on a social level, how we're doing through our email marketing, how we're even looking at paid to get that uh, message across saying, hey, we're the experts, let us guide you through these troubling times that we don't know uh, when they're gonna end. So we now now have to plan for that to be here for the good and, uh, and then also be thinking about how best we can address uh, people, uh, uh, their concerns when it comes to booking. And, uh, and so there's a lot of uh, challenges that are coming up about uh, with, uh, with COVID. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, you know, that goes away, but uh, we, we, you can't really, uh, you can't really strategize if, you know, if it's going to disappear for good or not. For sure. Those are great pieces of feedback. I mean, both of you guys mentioned quite a bit, just like thinking about the user. And like, I think that's such a big part of SEO in general, but even, even more with travel, just understanding like you said, the stresses that can go into booking a trip and it shouldn't be stressful. It should be easy. But nowadays with COVID, there's so many more things to anticipate and think about there. So how can you alleviate that for audiences? That's, that's great stuff there. Uh, Renee, go ahead. If you want to jump in and, and provide some feedback. For sure. Um, I think everybody sort of touch a, a different, uh, different points that I think are important. Uh, for example, I know Brian was talking about uh, or I believe Eric, uh, sort of about that Google My Business. I think it was sort of a year or, or throughout COVID, it's been a really a big opportunity to take more advantage of, of those Google My Business listings, especially with all those new features that are geared to give the information about COVID updates, uh, especially, uh, you know, for example, uh, in, the, in the United States, easily within, depending on the state, uh, you can have different types of closures and procedures. So that was a very a very uh, a direct way to put some of this information, uh, you know, right in the first uh, points of visibility for, for, for your brand, right? Uh, at the same time, I think it also gave uh, an opportunity for being able to rethink uh, how we position certain information, right? Uh, I know a lot of times, uh, you know, it's, well, actually most websites you go to, sometimes they'll have a banner or pop-up or something that it talks about their COVID, sometimes on the footer. And uh, sometimes it's not thought out how it's presented on, you know, the title tag and the meta description. So sometimes even those basic elemental sort of uh, 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 features sometimes get overlooked. And, and again, it's a great way to say, is there something that we can provide there on information, something as basic as opening closures, things like that. Uh, so really, you know, making sure that that, that uh, is positioned correctly. And going back to, again, that information on page. Uh, you know, having that a conversation with the web dev, you know, uh, is this is information crawlable? Is it indexable? You know, if, if are we slapping sort of our policy on an image and, you know, only, uh, you know, certain users are going to be able to see it, right? Uh, can our, you know, users with accessibility needs also access this information as, as well? Uh, and really also thinking back to, uh, I know, I know I'm, I'm going to sound a little bit of like a broken work, record with localization, but, you know, uh, one of the stats that we got from, from Statista was, uh, you know, sort of about 30 to 40 percent of people are returning to some some sort of travel throughout the year, especially during the holidays. And the majority of those are going to be through uh, most either going to be within state 
Uh, uh, so again, going back to uh, those types of ser uh, search results that uh, they may not be brand directed, or, but they're looking for different types of activities, uh, you know, what to do in San Diego, what to do in San Antonio, all those type of things, and find those opportunities for, for, for us to, uh, for, to, to connect in, in that as well. So I think, uh, uh, and making sure that the information uh, that is relevant for, for COVID is also there present. So I think, um, I, while, you know, maybe traffic has been impacted because of COVID, I think it's given uh, an opportunity to really use a lot of these uh, features and aspects uh, to much uh, a much more uh, you know uh, impactful way to to get that information uh, directly to our users. Fantastic, yeah. Just the the situation, the gravity of COVID, and really how I mean, like for all the negatives it's brought about, I feel like it like especially you're talking about Google My Business there, just how much more up to date we can be, in the the um, information we can provide in that now is is so much is. You know, so much more improved. So that's that's great feedback there. And then, how about you, Brian? What what answers do you have for that question of how COVID's affected travel for you? I mean, there's been so much great information here already, so I don't want to go too deep. But from what I remember, a lot of my clients back then were casinos, so they were all you know essentially scared out of their mind. I'm sure Eric can attest to this because it wasn't just about updating your Google My Business. It was could you even be open? Like, were you allowed to be open? And then once you could be open. What did that look like? So it was really important for us to communicate to those consumers what the policies were going to be going forward and making them feel safe. And then today, from what I see, it's really more about we have protocols, we wear masks, we clean surfaces, you know, staff have temperature checks, whatever that looks like, and just making people feel comfortable. Um, and really, up until recently, people. In the last, let's say, a few months, people were sort of calmer. I'm in Florida, so things are different here. But <laughs> you know, overall, I think people felt more comfortable. And now with Omicron, I think people are getting a little bit freaked out. But um, I think, again, it's just about being communicating, over-communicating, and letting people know um, that you're taking it seriously. Fantastic. And it's actually great. Vivi, uh, the link builder here, jumped into the question to a little bit more on COVID. And I thought this is actually good timing to just throw this one in there. Uh, they asked the question, were you early adapters to try new stuff out or did you wait to see what the competition did or were you just panicking? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think this is a good question. I think there's actually wisdom in each option being an early adapter or kind of waiting to see how things panned out. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into this one because I think it's a, a fun question. I think we got Kyle going first for, for this one. Yeah, uh, on a global level, uh, it was panic. Absolutely, we uh, we saw. Uh, you know, uh, Eric had alluded to the the closures of uh, hundreds of stores. We had thousands of locations we had to address, and that was devastating. We had layoffs, so it wasn't so much. You know, we, we were trying to curb the panic of layoffs, mass layoffs. It, it, it hit us on an emotional level, and uh, and that was the biggest impact. But also, we took a step back. I, I did speak to it earlier, stating that. We can have the times to create these projects. We have these availabilities to look at our stuff and get some of our recommendations actually implemented now and get prepared for when starts, you know, things start to open up. We're there and prepared for it. Uh, we're still not open, but we're still preparing ourselves for it. So we're working on that, getting our site, you know, authoritative, relevant, trustworthy, all of that type of stuff. Uh, that's that's just the best way to adapt is to, to, to be proactive. And that's kind of what we were doing. But uh, the emotional impact of it was very devastating. But the cool thing is, is as we start to open back up, jobs are coming back available, people are coming back available. That that that's that's great to see. Uh, but panic, uh, who couldn't panic? Especially if you're looking at this across multiple countries. Sure, isn't that funny? Like the number one headache for SEOs, and even I know, is like trying to you know get people on board with link building campaigns. Is that idea of like when do when can you get a C level person to just be willing to plan out for the future and wait to see these results for later. Devastation. Someone, yeah, like I need ROI now, I need ROI tomorrow. Yeah, that gave you an opportunity to do that. To like, hey guys, this actually is a good time to start thinking about six months from now or seven, you know, 12 months from now when things are reopening. So it's funny how uh, that all comes around. The, the SEO's dream of having oh, everyone yeah. in the organization excited to, to work on a long-term ROI. <laughs> and an experienced SEO is going to understand and say, I'm going to take advantage of that to my benefit. Yes. Exactly. I seeing the opportunity. <laughs> seeing it, right? yeah. Good stuff. All right, Renee, go ahead. Oh, uh, as far as, you know, whether, you know, or being an early adopter, uh, I, th I think it's just really weighing in uh, whether whatever feature or whatever, you know, uh, new move that we want to try out, 
you know, the sort of weighing out the, the, the effort, you know, payoff matrix type, uh, you know, it, how, how quickly can we adapt to it? Uh, you know, is it going to uh, be a huge interruption to our current operations? And, you know, uh, if we use also our user as a guiding principle is, is, uh, is this going to be a benefit for it? So I think if we use that sort of, uh, sort of, you know, loose checklist, it's, it's an easy way to, you know, sort of gauge if whether this is something to jump on uh, or, 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 or not. And overall, I mean, particularly, I've been someone that that tries to jump on on, on most as most new, new features or, or aspects, uh, just because uh, one of those things that I've definitely sort of got from Google is that a lot of their early suggestions is just a, 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 a just giving you a, a, a preview of what they're just going to implement later on. So uh, when they're you know when there's uh, certain tests or things coming out, it's like oh okay. Uh, you know, more than more than not, we're going to be seeing this, this, this later on. So it's it's a, it's a good uh, thing to just start, you know, being ready uh, ready for it when it starts rolling out, rather than like you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, crying fire once the implementation is, uh, starts happening and 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 you're you're you know you're found uh, having to work on it. Uh, but you know, like I said, uh, user user as as sort of a guiding principle, and and if it's a benefit. Uh, and it's feasible for the organization where the research is available. I think it's something it's always beneficial to to jump on it. For sure, that that idea of just be as being an SEO, you know, we often can sometimes get so honed in on on just our task. Yet yeah, SEO isn't really a silo thing. It's something that interacts in a lot of different areas. And so, like you said, there's so many other things to keep take into consideration with any SEO change. Just how does that affect the rest of the business, the rest of the website, those kinds of things. So great, great uh, ideas there. How about you, Brian? Uh, when it comes to big changes with with COVID, were you an early adapter? We to kind of see how things shook out, or or what were the feelings like for you there? No, we were definitely early adopters. We almost immediately started updating Google My Business because a lot of the casinos we were working. Oh shoot! Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, did I? Miss? <laughs> yeah, so I was just saying that um, all the casinos that we worked with had to update their hours and they had to close and off the bat as soon as we saw that you could do that as an agency we decided it was important and I think you know Renee kind of touched on it too but whenever Google mentions something that's new that you should try it's always worth trying you know there's a chance that the product may end up failing but um, it doesn't hurt yeah be proactive kind of sense the trends and the way things are moving and uh, have a plan in place for when those things come to fruition yeah Eric how about you uh, we, um, I mean, as Vegas as a whole, as you can imagine, we weren't exactly designed to be closed. So there was wood on do on spinning doors that have never been designed to lock. Um, but aside that on the, on the SEO side, yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> there really wasn't anything new to adapt to. It was, um, like Renee said, a time or Renee or Kyle, excuse me, to, to step back, just kind of reanalyze everything, uh, without the, the burden of having to <clears throat> create conversions constantly because <clears throat> there was no conversions coming in. We were closed for four or five months. Um, so wondering how do we just slow it down because sometimes it's not slow. Um, reassess everything. Kind of took that time to, to delete orphan pages and zombie pages that are just that have been there and nobody's looked at. I'm like, hey, I've, I never had the chance to see that because I'm I'm so concerned on looking at where these conversions are at. I'm not looking at everything to see all this little crap that's around that I need to take care of. So it was definitely a good time to just slow slow down uh, after we stopped panicking, slow down and, and not really adopt anything new, just kind of go back to the basics and clean everything up that really needed to be cleaned up. You know, it's very interesting to me to see, like, <laughs> I've, I've gone through a few different travel brands, just kind of the SCM rush, looking at traffic trends, all that kind of thing. How many you see take that big hit right when COVID happened and then come back even stronger after it? And I wouldn't say COVID's over yet, right? With Omicron, there's still stuff going on. But um, I wonder if a lot of people are experiencing that same thing that, you know, Eric and uh, Kyle and everyone's kind of talked about is that they had that chance to go back and really think strategically about some things. And then when it came back, they, uh, you know, people started coming back in and conversions started coming back and searches started, you know, volume started happening again. They, they saw the, the benefits of that. So great case study for just um, the importance of long-term thinking in SEO. And, and hopefully a lot of folks in higher positions and organizations began to see the value uh, of that. If sometimes it's not about the conversion you can get tomorrow, uh, it's about setting up uh, plans for getting even more a year from now. 
Um, all right, we got another question here. Let me jump in and, and see. Oh, that was just BB saying, hey, I really like how you, uh, how it gave you some guys to reassess things without. Yep, that's, that was a great takeaway from that segment there. Um, one question that BB asked, this is more of a uh, link building question. We'll see if any of you have any thoughts on this. If not, I always love talking about link building. It's a little personal passion of mine, but um, how do you do content ideation? So content ideation for linkable assets for passive links within travel and hospitality. Um, I think we're at Renee here for, for the first answer. Uh, well, I think, you know, for, for travel, it's, it's such an easy opportunity because for most of the nation, there is a lot to, you know, hold on, uh, you know, to localize. Uh, again, if you talk about the features of whatever, you, you know, of, of that, you know, particular uh, uh, destination, uh, or, or you know, if you if you it's a, it's a are a destination, the features you know to see there. Uh, there's a lot uh, uh, of of unique information that you can provide that obviously uh, uh, that my others might not have. So again, going back to those example, those third party sites that are going to be you know uh, 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 you know looking to your site for for this information. Uh, there's also those big opportunities for the local ones, right? Those city directories, those uh, uh, event, those city events that will be tied to that. Uh, so really making sure that, you know, you're looking at, at them, seeing what kind of information they're already linking to and see uh, and, and, you know, kind of uh, integrate that into your content plan so that, you know, you're providing this information that's already on demand and in and of itself will, will be gaining links uh, uh, or organically on its own. Yeah. I love that kind of that local angle. I know when we've done link building for hotels in the past. Um, getting involved in the local sphere of where those locations are, like kind of getting to know um, events was one way where we get a lot of links where there's an event at the hotel, going out and finding all the different re uh, calendars and event sites for the local areas. Um, even like finding like restaurants, sometimes uh, we're able to get links, um, you know, sorry, like universities even. So like universities will have like, hey, here's a place to stay when you're, you know, go to visit your kids, those kinds of like, just knowing the local community and finding sites based on that is, is a really good angle. Um, how about you, Brian, any thoughts on content, uh, to help earn links within the travel space? Um, I think it's you know, definitely a challenge, but usually having interesting content on your site, some kind of tool, some kind of infographic, some kind of information. So less about you or your brand and more about, uh, information that someone else may want to re reference. So if they're writing a blog post about the top you know, attractions to see in Paris or something, and you have some infographic talking about the Eiffel Tower that maybe they link to your page, something like that. No, that's like the number one piece I always have to give to people when it comes to creating linkable content is it's less about what, and it's more about who. It's less about your brand, less about your, you know, your stuff. It's more about the audience you're trying to connect with and what value. So that's, that's great feedback there. Um, I think we got Eric next. Um, yeah, for this, I might, I might be a spinning wheel and I've probably said it, uh, in a couple past and I'll keep saying again with MGM resorts and the high, um, profile of Vegas itself, MGM resorts being the biggest of, of the casino conglomerates here, I'm in a, a unique position. Um, I can post a page that says, Hey, come to Vegas and random sites, even high profile sites are going to start linking to it. <laughs> um, so then it, it turns into being more about, like you said, uh, who, what are they looking for? Um, again, the uniqueness of Vegas is that there's always something. CES just happened. World of Concrete is going to happen. Uh, January, huge for, for um, uh, conventions. And then you have things like EDC. There's a big concert with, uh, if you guys know, Usher and, and um, Little John, and then they have a big concert coming up in May. And these two are weeks apart. So create some content around that when people are coming, they, we know they're going to come for this anyway. How do we get them into our hotel? Hey, this is coming up. Um, you're going to stay here, uh, build an itinerary for them. An example itinerary, hey, you can stay here, eat here, go to the concert here. And then when you're done, uh, go and gamble or go to one of our clubs, Hakkasan or, or, or uh, whatever it may be. Build that itinerary so that they have to think less about what am I going to do? Oh, there it is for me right there. They already built my, my weekend for me to... Um, uh, one big example, I'm working on content right now for the Pro Bowl game. <clears throat> it's coming up uh, in a few weeks. Uh, and this kind of goes into one of the questions that BB asked about how do you start? When's the process for seasonal? When do you start? Um, again, unique position, 
Google picks up our pages. Uh, I can post a page right now and it'll be indexed and ranked uh, in the next two hours. I don't even have to push it to Google and say, hey, can you please index it? They're like, oh, we got you. You're so big, we got you. So that's, that's kind of great. Um, so we can do it a week before and it's gonna start ranking, but definitely thinking about the consumer and how they're going to consume the content and how is it gonna benefit them? That's the biggest thing because I'm gonna get a link anyway. Man, Eric, living the SEO dream over there. Just like, I'll oh, yeah. get links. They just bought, you know, they just pop up, right? Yeah. Which is, which is great. <laughs> which is great. I, I know the reason I love this is because uh, I know you like it, Michael. Um, I loathe link building. I hate, you know, I hate doing that. So when it comes naturally, I said, hey, this is the perfect SEO position. Um, <laughs> you hate it, but you know the importance of it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's <laughs> kind of... Uh, uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. It's a necessary evil, exactly. And, and I'm in the same boat as you. We, we were such a large brand that uh, we have that favoritism from Google. That popularity is already there. So there's not a lot we have to do, but it doesn't change my strategy on the local level. Uh, so, you know, consistency with your brand voice, especially being aware of your audience on a local level. Uh, Google has become very good at identifying audiences and demographics all the way down to the neighborhood level which means relationship building, which is what I call link building. That's what Google calls it too. Uh, that, uh, that has become even more critical, uh, difficult to uh, on a local level. Um, but uh, really, really that, uh, that, that, that's, that, that comes down to here in Denver, where I'm located, we have acronyms for our neighborhood, such as Rhino, Lodo, Brodo, all these different things. Uh, and so being able to speak to that, um, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, good. And uh, being able to speak to that on the local level and identifying those neighborhoods, but also the demographics within those neighborhoods. Google's very good at knowing 70% of uh, a specific race lives in this neighborhood. And if you're talking languages there, you gotta be aware of that. That is very, very huge. Uh, and also millennials, we're talking about different demographics, even to that level, you gotta, you gotta shift your voice to obtain that, uh, that, that link. But um, what you were talking to, like itineraries, getting creative about your resource content, as well as your evergreen content, those travel guides are huge. Those itineraries are big. But like I said, when I, we don't change our, our approach to, to link building, if you will, it's just, we adapt it to be more, um, you know, backlink gap analyses of trying to identify areas of best of lists because Eric and I, we, we were fortunate that we can get in some of those big lists that travel advisor can put us in those lists. And, and, but identifying where we aren't, where our competitors are, that's going to really move the needle on the bottom line. We have more of that ROI on our shoulders, making sure that, okay, we obtain this link, but is it impacting uh, traffic all the way down to the, uh, the, the conversion funnel, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. We have to think about all those different uh, conversion uh, stages along the way too. So there's a lot that goes into it. And, and in fact, to me, a relationship building and content go hand in hand and you have to look at it the same way. Um, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the things I think about when it comes to link building and creating linkable content is sometimes when you're in the travel industry, you think of getting links as like, I need to get links from other travel sites. And that's the only relevant way that I can get links you'll probably end up restricting yourself if that's the only way you're going to think about getting links. One thing that I would think about is how does travel affect and influence other groups and audiences on the web? So, yeah, exactly. you know, what is it like to travel with, with accessibility needs? You know, like what kind of rights, what kind of things should you be having there? If you create a guide for traveling, um, if you're disabled, that could help you get linked from a variety of great sites for that audience. And it exactly. brings travel to that audience and builds that, you know, relevant relationship there. Um, that's you know, that difference between resource and evergreens, whereas you're traveling with kids. Those are guides. Those are evergreen content yeah. that you can adapt over time. You can use your blog to talk a little bit more specific, like traveling with kids during COVID. We may not want that in our evergreen guide of traveling with kids, but we want to touch on that in our blog content, which is, has a, 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 an expiration date. So then we can do our internal linking. That really has an impact on that. So making sure that your knowledge hub and your blog and knowing, understanding your resource section and how that factors into your product verticals is critical. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So again, traveling with kids, another great niche audience right there. Like it's just, I think that's one of the big pieces of advice I always give to people when they're thinking about linkable content is just think about how can you build bridges and connections with other groups on the web and bring travel to them. And that'll help you to create a more sustainable um, yeah. mixed, mixed media, you know, you're doing webinars, podcasts are extraordinarily important, understanding the different types of links that are out there and engaging in that. That's another aspect to it, not just content. It's all content, 
but you know, mixed media, video, voice, whatever it is, get that engagement and amplify it. 100%. And sort of touching onto that, also being able to bring on, uh, uh, you know, of course, it's going to be more more akin to the large organizations. But if you have other teams that are promoting other uh, contents, you know, your 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 press releases, your uh, 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 all those uh, any any of the information that your marketing is putting out, you know, make sure that if if you are already not including them, making sure getting them to to uh, be not only buy in but also know that they have this power to be providing uh, 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 and working to, towards you know this. Uh, achieving these links. Um, but I think, uh, of course, uh, uh, all of these sort of advantages we were talking about really, you know, are for, for more recognizable brands or larger organizations. But uh, I think the main point for if you are a small or medium business is that you really, again, got to focus uh, uh, the, the main goal, are you the user? What are they expecting to see uh, on the information? Uh, uh, and then making sure that, you know, the links that you're trying to target or those sources that you're trying to target, what kind of content are they already linking and seeing if those, the, the relationship between your content and those, are, uh, you know, can, 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 you know, be established. And, and I'd, I'd love to jump in again, if I'm not talking too much, just let me know. But uh, even real world, world examples of, of this is goes on a national and local level, being able to identify your competitors, your true direct competitors on both those levels, because you're going to have local, you're going to have uh, a national, and then you're going to have a local national. So for instance, let's say you have a luxury resort in Santa Monica on the beach. Uh, so you, you, have, you offer villas, you offer suites, you offer residencies, and you offer guest rooms. Across the street is in a simple inn, okay? They have a simple guest room. You may look and think, okay, they're a competitor on a local level, not necessarily, not at all actually, but you can use that person even though they're in the travel space, it's very relevant, so you're hitting that relevancy. You can use them because your resort, let's say you have a luxury, or let's say you have a fine dining establishment part of your resort. You target fine dining Santa Monica. You can then partner with the person across the street saying, you might want to take get involved in this. You might want to create your own content around this because it benefits you saying, come stay with us right across the street. We've got the best fine dining in Santa Monica. That's that actual relationship building that is Google's looking at you're, you're hitting industry, you're hitting local, you're hitting a lot of things right there. And that's, that's how you can get really creative on that. Sure. That's awesome. Awesome feedback. Um, let's see here. We got a question from Madeline. Um, this is one, I don't know if there's, this is kind of a very specific question. I might just open this up to everybody and see if they do have an answer off the top of their head. But she asks, are there any tools you can suggest for automating an event calendar directly onto your travel website? You, uh, you can get in a lot of trouble with that, uh, especially with expirations and uh, not properly using 410s, but it depends on the CMS you're using, honestly. Uh, WordPress has some decent plugins, but they also have their troubles. Um, you've got, uh, it, it really, it, it's based on that, uh, that, uh, the, the CMS, but also what third-party integrations you can utilize. A lot of micrositing really helps out with that, where there's custom CMSs for events, that then you can somewhat take advantage of that. But um, there, there's a lot of things you can get in a, a little bit of trouble with. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I, I, we don't, we don't have anything uh, just because a lot of our calendars or whatever comes down comes from property. Um, so we're not automating it. We bigger, you know, bigger company good stuff. You know, we have more people to uh, to do that. Um, but I think, you know, on the flip side of that, instead of automating something like that, I'd, I'd automate or, or a programmatic, um, uh, schema for your, for your events, um, mm -hmm. making sure that, and maybe this goes across everything and maybe I'm getting off a little tangent, but when, when it comes down to schema and making it real programmatic is, is, um, you don't have to constantly update it and think about it, write it once and then allow your CMS uh, to pull different pieces to populate your schema, especially with events. Um, you might have, uh, like we have uh, Bruno Mars, he plays, you know, this date, this date, this date, and then you might cancel one. Uh, we don't want that schema up and live and people to see that and try and buy tickets or the time might change from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, and we want people to know that and understand that when they see Bruno Mars in Vegas, Google events comes up, we want that correct information there. So a little tangent on that, wouldn't automate an actual event calendar, but automate your schema for Google events. I think that's, that's definitely a good way to, to go about some automation. Yeah, wonderful. That's great. Um, we had a, I think it was uh, Kyle that kind of mentioned it, uh, kind of talking about the local nationwide, um, you know, for so many travel brands, especially like 
chains, for example, they do have a nationwide brand they have to consider as well as individual locations that maybe get even a little nitty gritty at that point. In terms of being a travel brand and balancing that out, how do you balance that between um, being a nationwide brand and objectives there and, and the needs of, of small locations or individual locations? We'll, we'll start with Brian on this one. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just thinking. So I think it's just key to have your local listing set up properly, making sure by location those are good, ranking at a national level, you know, I think there's less to do there. I think really you get more specific when it's local, right? So if you're in New York, Chicago, LA, you want pages about that, content about that. And then of course your listings, but ranking at a national level, um, that's usually more challenging. Um, because, you know, especially in travel and tourism, right, it's really kind of geo-specific. Someone's looking for a hotel in Vegas or Miami or L.A., so they're not going to just, like, Google hotels, right? Whereas maybe if it was flights or something or looking for an airline, but I think uh, it's really about local SEO there. For sure, for sure. Great answers. Uh, Eric, any thoughts on that, kind of that balance between local versus nationwide search? And <laughs> So here, here's where our, uh, my... my uh... MGM kind of, um, you know, it, it plays into my favor. So with, with MGM resorts, we have a bulk of our resorts and casinos in uh, Vegas. That's great. When it comes to local there, um, people know they don't really come to the strip anyway. If you live in Vegas, you don't go to the strip. It's, it's uh, definitely an off-limit place. Not off-limit, but it gets boring. Um, when it comes to local, um, we have other hotels and casinos in Mississippi, um, Springfield, which is Massachusetts, uh, Detroit, and uh, what's National Harbor, um, DC, Maryland area around there. <clears throat> so those casinos are in a, in, a, in a great position because we don't rely on actual travel and tourism to them. Uh, I think it's around 80 to 90% of hotel rooms there are comped for local players. So we're not trying to get people there. The biggest thing is just making sure that um, going back to Google My Business is that those things are updated for that local area. They're coming, they might be driving an hour or so. They don't want to drive that hour, hour and a half to go and have some fun at the, at the local casino and figure out that their favorite restaurant isn't open yet or it's been closed because of COVID or something like that. So make sure that that, that stuff is very up to date. And when it comes to Vegas, um, our local area is actually Los Angeles, San Diego. That's our local area, our drive market. People who are driving in every weekend to come gamble, do stuff for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then drive home and sit in traffic, unfortunately for them. Um, but that's our local market. So really catering to them, how do they think, what is, who's coming from there, uh, big you know, Latino population that's out there. How can we cater to them and make sure that they can find that information they want? Creating content in Spanish. We've done it before. Uh, it's worked really well. But again, just a, a unique situation that Vegas has that, or MGM Resorts has, where I don't have to think about any of our other local areas. I'm still thinking national. Um, but when it comes to national, um, for example, each market is different on how and why they come. New York, for example, we've got young stock millennial or now even Gen Z stockbrokers who make a good deal of money who want to come to Vegas and have this blowout weekend with their friends, uh, I think Wolf of Wall Street type of deal. They come fly in, crazy parties and who knows whatever else, and then fly home. Where California, LA, <clears throat> even um, some of the closer flyer mar fly markets, um, San Francisco, they might fly down with their family. It might be a 21st birthday. How are they and why are they coming? Uh, each market presents its little different niche on why they come to Vegas. So um, pulling those out, getting a user profile, which we really can't, but we try to build one in SEO, um, that's huge for us. Sure. I love that. It's like understanding the audience in each location. I think Kyle was talking about that earlier too, just how much Google can understand about the demographics, the groups that, that are in certain areas and how they act. Um, you know, I, my father-in-law lives in Vegas. So Whenever we go down there, he avoids the strip at all costs. Like we will never go to a casino on the strip. We'll only go to like the Silverton or South Point or something like that. That's you know off the strip, more of a locals uh, place. So those those locations, they probably are catering to a completely different audience, being the locals in the area with a different you know 
really kind of business focused than than a lot of the casinos are. So on yeah, the exactly. So yeah, to- totally different there. Um, but it's it's fun to to think of that different stuff and try different personas to um, create that content for those different personas. Definitely big. Fantastic. How about you, Kyle? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, we're a big brand, so we're we're targeting top of fun, you know, top of funnel terms. Oh shoot! Sorry, I muted you on accident. <laughs> I keep going to mute myself, and I mute the other person on accident. Sorry about that. Uh, mute yourself there. Perfect. Sorry. Excellent. All right. I think we're working now. Um. Yeah. As as a big brand, we're we're, we're targeting those top of funnel. Um, really short tail, high, uh, com- highly competitive, but high search volume terms, such as let's say hotel. Uh, we want to rank for that, but then we have to also do it to, to satisfy uh, user intent through all the conversion phases. So we have to hit them at the top of the funnel. Somebody that's searching hotel doesn't quite know what the heck they're looking for, in my opinion, uh, but somebody that's then searching on the regional or the country, then we have to hit regional, we have to hit state, we have to hit all the way down to landmark near Beverly Hills or near, you know, something like that. You've got to get down into it and you've got to capture them along the way so you're driving the uh, the funnel you're you're the one saying uh when somebody gets to your site you know what they should do next and we're the one guiding that's the biggest element there uh, when it comes to this and and knowing it but also your internal linking structure campaigns are huge if you're trying to get somebody into this specific conversion funnel of you know luxury hotel in beverly hills you're going for montage beverly hills or somebody you know you're trying to capture them in in a specific way so you have to have your content align you have to have your campaigns your your mixed channels have to do uh, their part too to get that really amplified to the mt level and uh, and so that really factors in so uh, that internal linking structure Another technical aspect that is a very critical uh, element to success these days, uh, especially capturing those people on the local level, regional level, national level, all the way up uh, and down. So it's uh, it, it's proven to be difficult, but it, there is a uh, there is a pattern to follow. Sure, I was going to say something. I know Renee like got excited about the internal linking. So oh, now no. we're doing. <laughs> well, my one thought I had was just I got excited because something that Eric mentioned too about the itinerary idea in mm-hmm. um, your content. Just that idea, like being a good marketer, and, and a lot of that is just guiding the people to the end result that you want them to get to. And and but but really, it's not that's not it's not even a manipulative thing though. At the end of the day, like everybody wants a guy. When you go to a new area, you're going to like travel somewhere different. You want to talk to somebody in that area to understand like what are the best restaurants I should go to. What are these things? And like if you are a brand that has a good presence in that space and you know a lot about there, you have the the resources to know a lot about it. Like that's kind of your duty is to direct them and give them that guidance. And you can do it in a way that, that both supports your brand and makes you a great, you know, so yeah, you mentioned that Kyle, I kind of flash back some of the, that Eric talked about. There's so many ways you can do that with your content and, and helping your, your user along their journey, but, you know, be a good marketer. And, and along the way you can guide them to that end result that you're, you're hoping for them to, to take. Uh, go ahead, Renee. <laughs> No, I got excited just because I was in agreement. Uh, it's like the first thing, one of, one of, uh, one of the challenges that I've always seen is, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, to, to the positioning, um, many, many times I'll see is that it's actually easier to position the national sites, right? Um, or, or just uh, the, 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 the main home pages. But and, and then those local uh, local pages or anything that maybe might be more specific, um, you know, a, a lot of the times we really got to look at the, the the site infrastructure, and it's a it's a moment to take that sort of uh, pause and look uh, whether your your menu layout everything is working in conjunction to make sure that there is no silos that that like uh, uh, Kyle mentioned that the internal internal linking is working whether they land on a homepage or or on the local site that there is a way for folks to be able to easily navigate through that. So I think it's one of those aspects where, again, it's really important to look at your technical SEO. Another downfall that I see a lot is um, because of scalability, a lot of times sites sort of adopt this uh, very uh, uh, sort of uh, um, layout where it's like the same sort of copy, switch out the city name, and then put it out there. And then you're really dealing with duplicate content. And not only are you sort of sort of shooting yourself in the foot with that, but you're not taking advantage of all those points that we're saying. You have the opportunity to have unique content so go ahead and do so. So I think it's it's a it's a for for this kind of uh, positioning, it, it's more of taking advantage of those situations where again for scalability, it might be easy just to copy and paste, but in the long run, it could be uh, something that is obviously uh, 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 could be detrimental to your overall SEO. Um, again, also uh, making sure that your your data markup is also going to be uh, 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 implemented in that way. So 
you know, whether uh, they're landing on a specific city, that all that information is able to be extracted from the page. Otherwise, again, you run into those sort of almost situations where it can cannibalize uh, or just, again, doesn't really uh, provide the information that we want on SERPs uh, uh, overall. And I think one of the other things is how it also really shifts uh, the, 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 the how we target keywords. These uh, national sites, you know, we're really going to be targeting the more brand, uh, more brand oriented, uh, 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 you know, phrases. And for a lot of them are just going to be, you know, uh, the, the intent is, is very different for maybe the ones in the, the more local aspect uh, where we maybe have to focus now on those long tail keywords uh, and, and step away from the brand and search. So um, I think it's it's one of those things where we, we also go have to go back to the technical aspect of it and then really, again, focus on that, on that, those uh, differences in intent. Yeah. And one of the things you said that almost kind of like was poked at me so much right there was you talked about that idea of like using the same content for each location, just changing a couple of little words here for your location. And so many people think duplicate content is the big worry, but you highlight something really important there that it's, it's like, it's, you shouldn't be so worried about like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm being bad and now Google's going to punish me. You should be like, what a missed opportunity that is from providing your users the information that they're looking for. What a missed opportunity that is to not be able to target keywords that people are looking for in those areas as they're searching and asking questions about them. The more custom that you are and the more unique you make that content, the more you can tailor that around um, what audiences are searching for, what they want, and what they're looking for in those areas. So uh, just a great example of how sometimes we got to get our minds out of just like worrying like, oh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to have duplicate content because of this, but instead think about it as how am I actually best serving my audience? Because really that's probably the reason why Google other than like plagiarism and those kinds of things, there's why Google doesn't like duplicate content because it's poor user experience and it's it, it's bad for that. So I thought that was great. We are actually down to the last couple minutes here. Um, I don't know if we have time to jump into a whole nother question. So if anybody else from the audience wants to submit a quick little question and have us rapid fire uh, an answer for it, go ahead. You're welcome to throw it in there. Um, I just want to thank the audience for, for some great participation and great questions so far. So We'll give you all another minute here to shoot in another question. Um, otherwise, as we work towards that, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists today, Brian, uh, Eric, Kyle, and Renee. Uh, I thought they had so much wisdom today. And uh, we'll have a recording of this published uh, on our website here in the next few days. So if you want to go back and review it, just come back over to our website. Um, the other thing uh, to keep an eye out for is just future webinars. We're going to be doing a webinar with Search Engine Journal on February 2nd about top link building mistakes to look out for in 2022. So uh, if you haven't already, go over to SEJ and, and look up that. Uh, I'll be giving that webinar and we look forward to seeing you there. So thank you all so much for joining us on the webinar today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon and have a great, have a great week and a great weekend and uh, best of luck out there in your SEO efforts. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.